Welcome to this episode of our podcast, Plugged Into Public Health. My name is Lauren, and I will be your host for today in the first of a two-part series featuring Dr. Jun Wong, an accomplished scientist and professor with deep expertise in atmospheric sciences. Dr. Wong is the James E. Ashton Professor in the College of Engineering, Chair of the Department of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering, and Assistant Director of the Iowa Technology Institute at the University of Iowa. His pioneering research combines satellite remote sensing and chemistry transport models to investigate critical topics such as air quality, wildfires, and intricate interactions between aerosols and clouds in the land atmosphere system. Dr. Wong has published over 210 research articles, holds an H index of 65, and has contributed to 10 satellite missions, reflecting his remarkable influence in this field. He also holds an impressive list of accolades, including NASA's new investigative program award, the AGU Joanne Simpson Medal, and the Iowa Board of Regents Award for Faculty Excellence. In this conversation, Dr. Wong shares his journey from a rural community in eastern China to becoming a leading researcher in atmospheric sciences. He delves into the early inspirations that sparked his interest in weather and climate, his educational and research experiences, and his perspectives on the collaborative, interdisciplinary nature of atmospheric research. Let's dive into this insightful conversation with Dr. Jun Wong and get plugged into public health. Thank you for being on the podcast, Dr. Wong. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk with us. My first question for you is a little bit about your career inspirations and give our listeners a little background on you. What sparked your interest in atmospheric sciences and how did you develop this career path and end up at Iowa? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Lauren. So I grew up in the eastern part of China Mm -hmm. uh, in a pretty remote area that basically is a very rural community. Yeah. um, So from early on in my childhood, I appreciate the importance of weather to the day-to-day lives in the farming. Yeah. Uh, and then the change of the climate year by year can have a huge consequences on their agriculture yield. Mm-hmm. The one part of the things that, that my parents were both farmers, so we, I appreciate all the importance of uh, the changing of the weather and the climate. And I personally find it very fascinating. Because yeah. today the weather uh, are different. And uh, sometimes you see the rain in one side of the river, but you don't see the rain in the other side of the river. That's kind of pretty cool. At that time. Yeah. And then another part of that is that in my hometown in Nantung, when I was a kid, we also fly kite a lot. Those are not the kite that normally you, you get from Walmart. Those are huge ones. Those are all kind of the, you made by your own with him. And they're mm-hmm. very huge and they can actually fly very high and make different sound, different kind of sounds. And, and then you, you want to fly that kite very high in the sky. You have to navigate your flying that kite in the air by you knowing the wind directions, by wind speed, around the kite in the right angle in order for them to fly up high and stay high. So I found that also fascinating when I was a kid. With all these two elements, one is like really day-to-day life going to affect our weather. Another one is the, a boy that you play with your childhood of friends all, all day long. And well, that's weather is really interesting. It's a critical thing that I can, can think of to study weather. So when I uh, graduated from high school, I, I went to a university to study my uh, bachelor's degree in atmosphere science. And I supposed to be a weatherman, to, be, uh, to, be, to work with the National Weather Service, to provide, uh, you know, uh, our seven kind of weather forecast for the, for the neighborhood. After I graduated with a bachelor degree, I did pretty well in my academics. So, and I thought that maybe we should, I should give a shot to just go to, to study more about how the weather really work instead of using a tool. The weather prediction generally use a model to predict the weather. So rather than using the motor output to say tomorrow, how the weather look like, I want to study how that model works. That requires a advanced degree. So I went to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Institute of Atmospheric Physics in Beijing. That's one of the top academic institutes for studying atmosphere science. And they have the best, at that time, the best computational facility there to do the uh, prediction of the weather. So you can say exactly the prediction of the weather is basically using computers and then together with the 
the data you collect around the world to mm-hmm. do a personal weather. And uh, I learned a lot there with a, a master degree in Beijing. And I actually did some forecast for some flooding events and all that. And uh, that time was in 1990s. There are many of my classmates at that time want to study more and get an advanced degree in the United States. And mm-hmm. so I kind of joined a crowd of the graduate students with master degrees coming to the U.S. to do their PhD in atmospheric science. So I ended up in the atmospheric science in the University, University of Alabama, Huntsville. The University of Alabama, Huntsville, you know, it's located in Huntsville, which is also co-located with the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Oh. And they're, they're well known for designing a Saturn V rocket to launch the or launch in, in, in Apollo era, they launched the design this huge rocket and they're able to launch the human to the moon and such. So they have a very huge facility in research in surrounded to the aerospace and the atmosphere science and many other things around the solid remote sensing. So I went in there, I spent a very good six years, almost six years there to get my PhD there. So this is where you really don't know how their life will lead you. <laughs> I go there to try to study weather, but but you want to study weather, predict the weather, you need to know what's the current weather condition look like. Yeah. Because air moves. If the, you know the air is coming from the north to the south, that cool air is coming, you know the next couple of days the weather will be cooler. But in order to know that a cooler air is in up north, move to your location, you need to have data to observe what, is, what we have right now. And then you can only put that many of the weather stations over land. Right, you cannot put that, that waste in anywhere, and there are many developing countries that cannot afford for it. So we turn out the solar remote sensing, the satellites from space, the weather satellites has a, a has a vantage point. It provides a global monitoring capability of the air temperature, the cloud mm-hmm. movement, especially many of the atmosphere conditions, the weather conditions, cloud movement over the ocean. You know, our planet, 70% is covered by the ocean. So you need to know how those things are happening over the ocean in order to project what's happening over land. So Sally Roman Center become a key tool there. So I learned a great deal, and that become one of my expertise is Sally Roman Center of Atmosphere. And then uh, afterwards, I did my PhD, and then I had an opportunity to, to go to Harvard University to study basically air quality. Because at that time, one of the frontier you started mercenary to study fires at that time. That's that is still almost 20 years ago. Uh, that, but at that time, most of the fires were, most of them occur in the developing countries because the farmers in these countries using fire as a tool to clear up the forest for land, for example, for example the Amazon. Yeah. Clear up the forest for, for farming. They also burn the proper resi- residuals after harvest. So you recycle all the nutrients back to the soil. However, that also causes a lot of environmental problems because when you burn things, burn the crops, burn the biomass, most of them goes to carbon dioxide, become a greenhouse gases effect, right? Did have greenhouse gases. On the other hand, they also generate a large amount of smoke particles, which lead to the very poor air quality. So I want to start answer chemistry, how the atmosphere composition is changing. So I went to Harvard to do a postdoc there. I finished the postdoc for two years there. And I had the opportunity to become a faculty member at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Over there, I trained many, many students and you study some of them are now actually working in the National Weather Service. I have one of my former students in Quad City, Weather, National Weather Service. I have another student in Omaha. I worked for the Air Force Weather Agency, and I was going to work for the Naval Research Lab. Turn out the weather prediction is widely needed in many things we do, many, many things we do. And then, so I spent nine years there, and then went here in the University of Iowa, had an opportunity to do big data, because they are looking for a faculty member to do big data in the position, and that's a good fit for me. So I decided to apply here, and I got the job, that's where I'm here. Since then, and I have been here for eight years. So that's where I kind of end up here. It's kind of a long story. <laughs> oh, that was a great background. You gave us like a lot of info about your discipline as well as some background about you. 
I also love hearing why people have like picked their chosen field and starting just when you were a little kid, you can just see how that has always been part of your story. I have a, I have a couple of follow up questions. Sure. Oh, number one. So I didn't know that. Well, I mean, I guess I probably could have guessed that models are used to uh, predict the weather. So my question is, how accurate are these models? Uh, that's a very good question. So these models basically is a realization of all the physical laws, chemical reactions, and the best knowledge we have about what we know regarding the air and the land and how the Earth as a system works. So for example, we definitely have equations similar to F equal to MA, which is Newton's law. We also have an ideal gas law. You give the temperature and the pressure, you can able to correct the volume of the air, things like that. We also have as con conservative equations because the air mass does not change much. We also have the equation to describe the phase change of the water from water vapor to ice to, to liquid and how they are exchanged. You know, all have all those equations put in the model. So essentially, the, this model is a realization of a set of many, many partial derivative equations as a function of time. In order to solve these equations, you have to know two things. One is the initial condition or boundary case. You have to know our current stage, current, condi current condition, how the weather looks like in terms of temperature, air movement, the clouds, water vapor, you name it, including the soil. You know, today we had rain. Guess what? The temperature this afternoon will be much cooler than the day you don't have rain because the soil will be evaporated. Yeah. So it's a system. So you need that kind of information to do the prediction. Another part of the story is that this part of the new effect equations, unfortunately, don't have an analytical solution. That is not like dy over dx equal to a, then y equal to x plus b. Mm -hmm. That's simple. Because you have this equation is not, there is no analytical solution for it. Therefore, you have to use computers and to design what we call a numerical scheme to solve them more or less empirically, more or less approximation form. As a result of that, your prediction has several errors. Yeah. One error is that you don't really know perfectly the current condition, what's the weather look like. For example, you don't know one or two miles above the surface, what the, what the temperature looks like exactly. You don't know after, right after rain, how much soil moisture exactly we have. So it's not in our city. We don't know that. So we can only estimate that. And lots of source of error get passed to the models. Another source of error is what we call panelization. Because ideal gas law, for example, is able to simulate the, the air temperature, air molecular movement, all those things. But our computer is not big enough to track each air molecule. So we have to do the parameterization. Basically, we divide, divide the globe into different grid boxes, different chunk. So we call it grid box spatial resolution. In the U.S., our day-to-day -day weather prediction maybe get to, can get, get you about three kilometer, maybe one and a half mile spatial resolution. But within that, that spatial resolution, we cannot resolve, for example, things like irrigation. Maybe you require your lawn, not in our neighborhood. But that water added in the soil will not be reflecting our predictions. So there are a lot of things that is because of that approximation is simplified. So that's a source of, of error as well. Yeah. So those errors are together lead to the weather as errors. So I would say that numerical weather predictions start during the World War II at that time, because for any uh, military operations, you need a weather intelligence, right? So you need to know if there are dust storms, there are sun storms, things like that. So people have been trying to do the weather prediction since using new, uh, computers. I would say the prediction accuracy has hugely improved in the last, you know, 50 years. Now I think the weather prediction is actually pretty accurate, very, very accurate. We are talking about 90%. In wow. The, yeah. In part is because of the satellites. Satellites have the global coverage to tell you where the air is, where the temperature is. We are putting a lot of satellite data into the predictions. But still, the more harder problem is that how do we put them as a system? Like if you have a fire, then you inject a large amount of smoke particles in the air. And that layer of smoke particles in the daytime will reflect a lot of sunlight back to space. So you will have a shadow. On the ground, your temperature will be cooler. Traditionally, I was not considering weather prediction. Now, mm. today, we try to use that to integrate into the weather prediction, make it more accurate. 
It's more like you have a curve here. In the beginning, it's relatively easy to improve the accuracy with our solid data. But slowly, that, that curve gets steeper and steeper. You get accuracy increase by 1% or 2%, which is how to spend a lot of efforts to get, to get that more closer to the, to the perfection. So anyway, that's, that's, that's kind of how we're doing with the prediction today. I didn't realize how many factors went into it. And you're right, there's so many things that there's no way that you can account for, like people watering their lawns. Right, right. Kind of like what you said going back to when you were a child, rain would be on one half of the river, but not the other. There's all these like little localized systems that there's just no way exactly. you can account for all of that. And then my other follow-up, when because you, you were talking about these weather satellites, how many of those are there circling the planet? Oh, those are on the hundreds. So oh, wow. Of, yeah. Weather community is very different from the rest of the community. The weather and atmosphere science community are very collaborative because we know air moves. Sometimes it moves, you know, look at the hurricanes and stuff like that. It can move 100 miles, 80 miles, 50 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So we have to collaborate in order to do the weather prediction. From early on, the world weather meteorologist you know, people do the weather studies, always very collaborative. We share the data all the time because otherwise you cannot do the prediction. You're right. right. This cannot, the satellite, those are civilian sites of satellites. For example, in the United States, we have constantly, we have two geocentric satellites. That mm -hmm. one look at the East Coast, another one look at the West Coast, and they all cover the central U.S. Mm -hmm. and provide the data almost every five to 10 minutes. Wow. On the cloud movement, on the lightning, on the hurricane, on the convect, convection systems, on the crop growth, they are constantly giving that. And NASA launched a lot of satellites. Each country has their own civilian satellite for weather. So on, on the order of hundreds. Your work spans various disciplines. It's obviously collaborative. And I know that it includes maybe some public health components as well as some agricultural components. And so how do... How does the collaboration or all of these um, interdisciplinary people help to enhance your research on weather? That's a very good question. So I'll give you one example. For example, my master's degree, I primarily started atmosphere dynamics. Basically, mm -hmm. how the air moves, wind speed, and all that prediction. But then later on, we want to study cloud formation. And we want to study cloud formation, we want to know how the water vapor will condense into liquid water, how the liquid water become ice. And those processes we call a microphysical process. And those processes requires chemistry. The knowledge about chemistry, how a, let's say a smooth particle will provide a service for water vapor to condense. Because if in a, in a very clean atmosphere, there is no particles, then for that water vapor itself to co coalesce and become water droplets. It's very, very difficult. But if you have some little dirt, run a service for water vapor to condense, they are much easier to condense. They will form a liquid water and form a rain. So this process will get into the microchemistry side of the scene. Some particles are more easier for water vapor to condense than others. Like sulfate acid is more easy for water to condense because they have affinity with respect to water. Dust is harder, but dust is good for water vapor to directly become ice. So those things need a chemistry component to it. So I study a lot of chem atmosphere chemistry. And another part of the story is, for example, the crops, right? Look at the winter time. Winter time, there are new crops. Therefore, when the sunlight is coming on the surface, most of the sunlight will be reflected back to the atmosphere, right? In the winter time. But if you have the summertime, you have green canopy, photosynthesis will happen. This solar radiation will be used by plant rather than to grow, to increase the temperature. It was used to be, become make for crops to do photosynthesis to generate food. Yeah. So in that case, you need to work with the, you know, folks who study the ecology, who study the plants to know how we can estimate how much solar radiation is used by plants for their own growth rather than increase the air temperature. So I just give you two examples like this. So we, yeah. and then we, we deal with solar when sensing, you also deal with people who make your satellites and later I have, I work with them a lot. They are from all the disciplines in the engineering field. 
from system engineering to electronic engineering to communication to uh, aerospace engineering to optics design. So you start to expand your boundaries to know more and more people start to find you learn from different people in different fields how they're seeing. Right. Yeah. I agree. That is fun. And I think it's so interesting how all of these fields can come together and whether in particular impacts so, so much of our lives. So it's not surprising to me that it's a really inter interdisciplinary field. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the lab that you run, which is the Atmospheric and Environmental Research Lab. Can you explain some of the core research areas for the AER lab at the University of Iowa? Yeah, sure. Uh, one side of the thing is that we do, actually, I want to say four components now as, as our lab continues to grow. Mm -hmm. The first component is really the solid remote sensing of the fires, of aerosols, air pollution. Um, that's one, one component. Another component is a model prediction. So how do we assimilate? We call assimilate. Basically, use the solid data, this novel solid data into the models to better predict the weather, better predict the air quality, better predict the climate change. That's the second part. The third part is try to bring these two together to help NASA, to help different agencies to plan their future satellite missions. Satellite missions cost a lot of money. And once up there, it's very difficult to fix or change if, if they are in the air. So how do you design a satellite that serve your purpose with a limited amount of the money? It's a very challenging question. In the past, we just get the points, then we design this way, and then we launch the satellite to space. But if the later we find, oh, some of the design are actually useless, some of the design could be have done better, and then we just accumulate knowledge for the next design. But with the current market where the SpaceX launch, the launch of satellite getting cheaper and cheaper, Yes. There is a new te technology for small sat launch and all that. There is a desire to launch more and more satellites in smaller weights, in more smarter modern manner. We have a need here is try to help design the satellite with the computing. So we're we'll saying if you design the satellite this way, what kind of data you are going to get by combining our modeling capability and the solar simulation capability, we can produce the synthetic data, we call it synthetic data, mm -hmm. that setting if the solar design this way and flying this way, these are the data you're going to get. So in the computer, in this way, we are simulating, we call the observation system simulation experiment, we call it OSI. We basically say, well, if you design this way, what can you have? By doing so, the design is more objective, but it's also cheaper. So we can provide a many options for those funding agencies or for anyone who wants to launch satellite, you say, well, here is the limit of your budget. You do it this way versus that way, here are the data you get. So they decide what's the path forward. So that's the third, comp third component. Yeah. The last component is really try to do more interdisciplinary research. By taking advantage that the University of Iowa is a very comprehensive university. We have people like you from popular health, we have people from pharmaceutical, from business, from law, mm -hmm. art, science, engineering. But the ambient atmosphere uh, affects all of us, right? In 10 minutes, if you don't have, to have oxygen in 10 minutes, we need to have cause and have air. Uh, yeah. So air quality affects humans' lives. And then in Iowa, the weather is so dynamic, you see weather effects. So we want to do more of those things to collaborate with people from different disciplines to see how the weather intelligence, like our weather intelligence information, can help to improve our sustainability of our planet, to improve people's day-to-day -day planning, their quality of life. So we do a lot of the industry work to help to do the precision agriculture, air quality prediction, or do renewable energy. The wind prediction is needed for the, because in Iowa, the, the renewable energy is big. We are number one, number two in the nation in the wind energy production. So you want to know tomorrow how the wind look like, right? And the things like that. So, so there are a lot of veterinary work surrounding these areas, even including how the weather affects your mood. For example, we find on the feds, but those are in the oldest study, we find in the feds, but it's the winter time or the summertime. People are generally happy in, in our summertime and in the wintertime. 
right. on a first look because of the weather uh, effect. But four components here. So. Okay, so this is where I'm going to cut the episode for this week. Thank you so much for joining us in the first part of this conversation with Dr. Wong. His journey from a rural upbringing in China to his groundbreaking work in atmospheric sciences at the University of Iowa really showcases his deep commitment to advancing our understanding of climate, air quality, and environmental sustainability. Dr. Wong's insights into the power of satellite technology and data modeling revealed just how interconnected our atmosphere is with our health, agriculture, and energy sectors here in the U.S., and how collaborative research can really be and how it can lead to innovations that improve all of our worlds. In the next episode, we'll continue our discussion with Dr. Wong, exploring more about his lab's latest projects, the future of remote sensing, and his thoughts on the next big challenges in atmospheric science. So make sure you tune back next week for that part of it. We look forward to having you back for part two, and we'll dig even deeper into his work. Until then, thank you for listening, and stay tuned next week. This episode was hosted and written by Lauren Lavin and edited and produced by Lauren Lavin. You can learn more about the University of Iowa College of Public Health on Facebook. Our podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help support the podcast, please share it with your colleagues, friends, or anyone interested in public health, and make sure to hit that subscribe button. Have a suggestion for our team? You can reach us at cph-gradambassador at uiowa.edu. This episode is brought to you by the University of Iowa College of Public Health. Until next week, stay curious, stay healthy, and take